Hello, my name is Keith Edwards, and I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach. And you can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. Today, I get to be with you to talk about the wonderful work that folks in residential education at the University of South Florida are doing and moving from uh, in person and on floors and in buildings and in community to now remote engagement of their students living on campus. And they were uh, on the cutting edge of this and thinking about this as many of us were just starting to manage this crisis. So I think they have a lot of lessons to learn. Uh, hopefully this will generate some ideas and some innovation from others and we can learn from their good thinking and also hopefully from some of their mistakes and their lessons learned as well. Before we get too far into this, uh, I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves and share their name, their role, their pronouns, uh, and then we'll jump into this. I forgot my pronouns, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, so we'll turn it over to Corey. If you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Hi, my name is Corey Johnson. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I have been at the University of South Florida for about four years now. Um, and in my current role, I serve as an assistant director for residential education and um, work directly with our residential curriculum on the day-to-day. -day. Awesome, thank you. And hello, everybody. My name is Michael Prozia. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I serve as a senior residence life coordinator here at USF, um, and I've been here for about four years and some change. So glad to be here with you, Keith. Glad to have you. Hello, everyone. My name is Brandi Cruz. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am a coordinator for academic initiatives. So I work closely with our living learning communities and our faculty engagement, and I've been at USF for about three years. Awesome. Well, thanks to all three of you for taking time to set aside to share your good work with others and contribute to the profession and ultimately to students. Um, let's begin with how did this shift come about? I mean, we've all been uh, moving to online classes. We've all been closing halls and navigating the full complexity of that and crisis management. And you all started earlier than most thinking about how you would take the engagement and the learning and the community building and how you do that through remote engagement. So Corey, could you begin by telling us a little bit about how this uh, thinking came about for you and how it began to emerge? Yeah, so about five weeks ago now, um, our director, Julie Leos, was in a meeting where the provost asked, what can we do to move the rest of the semester online and what what could that look like having um, doing the capacity of our role from a remote virtual space and um, so she called me and was like what do we need to do um, and so at that point we still had we were in the middle of an intentional conversation we had all of our closing work to do and um, all of those wrap-up things that are pretty key to the end of the year making people reflect and um, feel good about where we're at and so from there we just started talking about what operationally we would need to do as a department to get ourselves to the end of the year and what that could look like if we moved it to a virtual capacity um, and we started thinking there um, the other place where this started was in a meeting with our curriculum team we kind of set aside okay we know operationally we're going to have to do some stuff um, and we're going to have to figure out how to close and to help students move out but we also um, are in a space to help talk to them talk them through that and what those challenges might be and and how can we keep them engaged too and so from more of a positive psychology perspective we started throwing out ideas of how would you engage students if you couldn't actually be in the same space with them. And that has led to a pretty cool brainstorm with some of our coordinators um, thinking about what does bingo look like if we're not all in the same room? And what does um, prizes look like if we're not all in the same room? It, it, we kind of started by dreaming big and then whittling it back down to reality. And I think that's where Michael came into this conversation. I feel like that's an invitation, Michael. How did you come into this conversation? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think another thing to point out um, is uh, Julie tapped into myself and one of our other senior residence life coordinators, um, her name is Steph, um, to imagine where this could live, right? So with our residents no longer living with us in the actual sense, we have lost space. We have lost the opportunity for students to come together 
and create their own spaces. And we've lost the opportunity for us to create those spaces as well in a physical sense. And so- So we've lost residence hall lounges, we've lost hallways, we've lost bulletin boards, we've lost actual physical space for people to gather. Absolutely. I mean, in Florida, we've lost outdoor space. We've lost on campus, you know, taking students to our campus rec center. We've lost all of those things. And so how, what do we have to leverage uh, virtually, remotely for us to create those spaces for the learning to still occur and for the engagement of our students socially to still occur when those relationships were cut short by our current status? And so um, that was, I think, Julie's and the team's goal was how do we, how do we facilitate that? And how did your residential curriculum, the plans and the details you had in place, as Corey mentioned, you're in the midst of a round of intentional conversations. How did that support this shift to remote engaging students and fostering student learning? Oh, Michael, you're, oh, there you go. Good. Uh, yeah. We actually quickly shifted to um, utilizing our learning management system on campus. So. Uh, the way that we have found that space become a reality is by using Canvas. Uh, luckily, we are familiar with Canvas, um, even though you know faculty use that for their courses and our students are in there all the time. We have been using Canvas uh, in our residential communities to supervise our resident assistants and our community managers um, as a place, as a hub for our residential curriculum um, electronically because they're familiar with it and it's a supervision tool. Uh, for us. And so luckily we have been using that for a while. Um, and so uh, I have been working over the last few weeks to kind of perfect what that Canvas course has looked like, mm -hmm. gaining feedback from peers about how do we make this as engaging as it can be. Um, and we also took the approach of utilizing YouTube sensations and influencers and video game streaming as a nerd myself, video game streaming on Twitch and on Discord is huge for some of our students. And so mm -hmm. trying to create um, a combination of reimagining our two educational strategies of passive resources and events um, as the Canvas course is like a deep dive into a reinvention of a passive resource we can blast it into a virtual hub with everything we want and can space information out that we change out throughout the rest of the semester for what we know our students are experiencing and needing. And we can create live streams through Canvas, sharing out information to students that way, that's more active for students to engage with our staff and with faculty and with LLC partners and all of those kinds of things. So um, that's kind of how we've done that. And We've been doing it now for two weeks and we continue to keep changing how we're doing that as we continue to learn what our students need from us. Yeah, let me just kind of summarize and share back and, and feel free to correct me where I might be wrong. It sounds like there was, uh, if you were thinking about this five weeks ago, um, here we're, we're recording this on Friday, April 3rd. If you were thinking about this five weeks ago, someone was way ahead of the game and thinking very far ahead. So that, that's a great asset. I'm also hearing that you're using your Canvas, your learning management system, others might be Blackboard or Moodle or different things. And you were already using that, I imagine, for training, for storing your facilitation guides, for your curriculum, for, for sort of structuring that. So you, you could quickly leverage that. And the curriculum you had in place for in-person was useful for you to then help you make a shift over. So you weren't creating something new, you were taking what you had and seeing what made sense there. Um, what else is sort of critical to folks understanding how this shift came about for you? I think the no? other the other part of that um, is knowing how our university operates in that way that um, we we move and we move fast um, and and so we as a team have built up we've built this um, capacity within our team and within our professional staff, especially um, to respond to those problems really quickly. Um, and it, we like to say it's all about how we hire and hiring is so important. And um, I think that that has helped a lot. Um, we bring our curriculum into how we hire our student staff. We bring it into how we hire our professional staff. And so 
they're kind of, this is something we've never experienced before, right? No one has experienced right. this at all. Um, and so the fact that we're able to move quickly is helpful because we were able to put together a team um, of professional staff members who could quickly move to uh, what we've now deemed Bulls in the Cloud, which is our Canvas course. Um, What's the name of it? It's called Bulls in the Cloud. Isn't all that right. fun? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, we really like it. Um, so we were able to get onto that so quickly because we had a team that could focus on the learning part and the moving forward. Well, we still have another team that's focused on, okay, how are people moving out? How are people um, interacting in the halls? How, how are we shutting down those lounges and shutting down those hallways and, and making sure that people still are remaining physically distant? Mm -hmm. um, and so by being able to have a team that can hold both, we were able to make this switch a lot quicker. Um, and we've, we've seen a lot of success because of that. Right. I think this is a really good point. I mean, the language that I would use is that you have a culture of learning and a culture where we don't get stuck in what we wish it was, but we're, this is what's real. This is what we're doing. How are we going to adjust? And people are able to be nimble. And I think that's, that's one of the real misunderstandings about our curricular approach is people think, well, if we're going to be so prescriptive about all of this, where's the flexibility? And what you're demonstrating is having all these things planned out allowed you to be super nimble about shifting to a different venue um, and a different way of engaging the learners. And, you know, the hiring certainly comes into who you hire and how you hire and how you onboard and you create that culture. And if you have a culture of moving fast, uh, then you're always learning. And that really serves you well in the regular day to day. But as you're pointing out in this new reality that no one knows how to do this, nobody knows how to do this. So we're all kind of making it up as we go. Um, and I know Michael said his job was to kind of perfect canvas, but um, perfection is the enemy of good. So how do we not get caught up in that? Try and make it better and better each time we go. Well, great. Um, I think people are super curious. I, I commend you on the shift and doing it so quickly and being ahead of the game. I think people are really curious uh, about what you have created. What are the events? What are the processes? How have you used canvas? Um, others maybe are using that. Others are using other things. Um, tell us some of the details. I think, Michael, we're going to have you lead us on some of this. To make sure still happened was an opportunity for our professional staff to still maintain connection with their specific buildings and their communities. And so um, the structure as a whole, we were able to um, add residential communities as sections within our course. And that allows our residence life coordinators to act as teachers in the course, mm -hmm. and they can design specific communication, discussion boards specifically for their students in their communities. While the team that manages Bulls in the Cloud, like Corey mentioned, um, we get to do the bigger level department wide sort of things. Um, and so we were able to do that. And then um, Brandy's team was huge and adding Brandy to this team early on was essential because um, we needed to infuse academic initiatives and our living learning partners into this process and our faculty and residents and our faculty fellows to make sure we weren't missing those pieces. And so we were able to create student groups for our living learning communities that is where our living learning partners live. So mm -hmm. our academic advisors or our campus partners for each living learning community now have their subset of students within a student group that they can communicate with and engage with through that way. Um, and then we've just been thinking about what are our students needing right now? We knew right at the beginning it was gonna be transition to academic success in a remote learning type of atmosphere. So we got the student toolkit from the university that has tips and tricks. Our team put together its own sessions and we did live streams with professionals around um, how to be successful virtually. We also knew wellness is a huge factor that we keep talking about. How do you stay physically safe, of course, but also how are you taking care of your mental wellness and your emotional wellness during this time? Um, so we've been doing things like mindful meditations and yoga sessions that we've been having our staff facilitate because they're, uh, they do, to, do those things on a regular basis or have learned how to do those things for themselves and sharing that knowledge as well. Um, so. Um, so that's a little bit about that. Um, we've created a large scale schedule of our events throughout the week. Um, and 
uh, trying to, for the live stream portion. So um, we invite our members of our team to create content for us, whether it be something fun like playing Animal Crossing on the Nintendo Switch, um, where we had like 20 or 30 students yesterday watching one of our RLCs play, our uh, residence life coordinators play Animal Crossing, right? Um, versus something like Brandy has done, and she could talk more about this from the AI lens about um, uh, how do we remain successful in this place? How do we navigate the, we have a grading change for our students to choose from, from the traditional grading scale to a pass fail. So how are we navigating that on a case by case basis? So um, I'll let Brandy talk a little bit more mm -hmm. about um, how we've infused some of those living learning partners and the AI too. Right, and before we get Brandy in here, it sounds like there, there's some different levels. There's the macro level as you're talking about at overall events and things that you wanna reach all of the students who were living on campus. Then there's also a more micro level about the building and the floor level. And then there's also the living learning community and, and those student groups. And so you're able to engage broadly, but then also talk to people, which I think the interesting thing about this is that really makes sense to do when you're, when you're stopped in the middle of a semester. And for folks who are now beginning to plan for next fall, would that still make sense to try and do things by building your floor if students didn't already have those relationships? Maybe it would, but I think that's an interesting thing to consider. So I love this macro level, but also a couple of different micro levels. Brandy, let's get you in here and tell us about how you're involving faculty and the academic, academic initiatives and the living learning community. Yeah, um, so for AI, a big thing was we wanted to be in front of students as an AI team, but we also wanted to dedicate time to our faculty to be able to engage and create a time and for that. And AI is your academic initiative, yes. right? Yeah, yes. great, go ahead. Um, and then, so typically, so the first week what we did was we started with our academic initiatives team and we just really wanted to talk about remote learning. How are you feeling? Gauge where students are. Um, and then we also had our faculty come in to just talk with students who, um, one was a chemistry um, and engineering instructor and then the other one um, is the director of undergraduate research. So we were able to bring in different pieces of learning and academic engagement through that. And then we were also able to end the week with, you know, kind of gauging where students were and how they were feeling. Um, we kicked off this week with talking about grading options. So that came out, we recognized through some of our meetings that we were having with our student staff that students are feeling overwhelmed. Um, so we really have taken it week by week for the AI team um, because we recognize that we can't plan weeks in advance because students are at different points. So now we're recon recognizing that wellness is coming into play. So next week, AI has a very strong focus in wellness and what does that look like? And so um, we've tried to really structure that out from this macro lens to all of our students, but also we've worked with our LLC partners to host these trainings that allow them to really understand their role in the Canvas course and how they navigate their LLC group. Um, Michael and I actually spent about an hour and a half just doing a training and walking them through what that looks like. Um, they are able to engage with announcements, discussions, they're able to stream within their specific group. So they're able to have these opportunities to engage with those students. A big reason why this came about was because we have fee funded LLCs. So we have students who pay to be in a living learning community each semester. And we knew that we still needed to provide those experiences to those students who are participating in living learning communities. And so we actually have moved our Friday session to be LLC hour. Um, so every Friday our LLCs will engage within their groups and have streams during that time with in-hall academic advising, um, posting articles and talking about how that um, affects maybe their career aspirations. What does that mean for them in their careers? Um, and so we're really trying to keep that career readiness piece in the midst of it as well. And so really taking the curriculum and our academic engagement piece and really engaging through that in the Canvas course. Well, a couple of things that, that are really standing out to me as I'm, I'm listening to this. One is, I think Corey mentioned this positive psychology approach. Um, how do we teach students how to be successful in this? How do we teach them to be successful at using the technology of remote learning? How do we teach them how to choose the grading option that's best for them? How do we teach them how to be well? How do we teach them new skills to navigate this? So. I think so often we get caught up in waiting for students to almost fail 
and then we spend a lot of energy rescuing them. But now you're kind of teaching at the macro level. Here's how you can be successful from the very beginning. And I'm sure you were doing that all along, but now you have a new way of teaching them to be successful. Um, so I, I love that approach about how do we teach students to succeed here. The other thing is you're, you're continuing without providing rooms and lounges and group bathrooms. You're continuing to meet students' need for connection and for meaning and purpose. Uh, and what that used to look like was one thing, and now you're still trying to meet that need for connection and meaning and purpose, which I think we all need, right? We're all looking for connection as we're all in our different homes. <laughs> uh, we're looking for connection and we're looking for meaning and purpose. Um, and and the, the, the third thing that I'm taking away from this is you didn't just take what you had planned for the end of March and April and move it online, right? You're thinking about how do we engage remotely in this meaning and connection and you adjusted things to meet this new reality and having detailed plans helped you adjust to meet this new reality. So uh, I'm hearing the examples you're giving. It is very much grounded in this reality. It doesn't feel like you came up with this last fall and we're going to it and it doesn't make sense. Um, are, are those some, some key takeaways for you, Brainy? Yes, I would agree with that. I think, you know, we do have some large scale things that we are trying to make in a remote world, um, like our finals reviews, where our faculty will host final review sessions in addition to what they host in the classroom. Um, we typically get 2000 students out of that large scale event. And so we knew it was also even more important now being remote. How are we, you know, connecting our faculty with that still. Um, and so we are slowly working through the pieces of launching our faculty into that as well. So we're really trying to keep those large scale pieces that if they can be remote and can support students that we're also keeping that too. But we definitely are grounding in what's happening now and moving with it day by day and taking it as we can based off what we're learning from students and faculty. Yeah. Well, I want to get to the lessons learned, um, but I, I want to go back to something Corey mentioned before. It sounded like this began with operationally, how do we do this, very quickly moved into how do we do this operationally and how do we do this in terms of engagement and learning and our ability to do both and i think so many people are setting aside the engagement and learning and just closing buildings getting students out managing distancing managing all of this managing fees and refunds and paperwork and all this complexity which is absolutely real but you sounds like as an organization had a team working on that and also at the same time had another team working on some of this part of it and if you, you've been doing this, you're not just thinking about this, you've been doing this for two weeks now. I think most people are just kind of getting past the operational crisis and maybe now beginning to think about this, but you, you've been so far ahead of the curve. What have you all learned uh, from two weeks of implementing this? Um, you know, other people are gonna watch this and, and hear you and, and wanna implement this. Could you save them from some huge embarrassing failures <laughs> by your own experience? Help us out. Yeah, I think for us, um, it really is trial by error. So, you know, we, much like we start the first of a semester, we walk in thinking we kind of know what students need in that moment. And then we have to revise as we go to make sure that we are really meeting the needs of the students. And so, um, for us, a really big piece has been our announcements. So we have a lot of people engaging in our bulls in the cloud right now. We have a lot of people who are posting their virtual office hours, engaging with students. Um, and on the back end, these students are getting all of these emails, not only from their instructors, but also from our team. Um, and so we've been trying to create now a how are we kind of streamlining this communication what does that look like you know in the moment we all were so excited to be on there and we were so excited to engage and still be able to have those connections mm -hmm. and now we're like oh we're sending them so many notifications a day and we haven't even noticed it um and so you know we appreciate our students who provide that self-advocacy and say can like you're overwhelming me can you just like take a step right. back well um, and this is a great lesson for all of us to learn about essentialism Right, and not just in what we're doing, but how we're communicating it. And if we can get the six emails that we're gonna come from Housing and Residence Life today and get them down all into one, that's better for everybody because they're getting emails from each instructor. So uh, one good lesson is essentializing what and how you're communicating, right? Yes. Great, what else have we learned? 
I think another big thing for us is recognizing that training is ongoing. Um, we trained our LLC partners and we gave them a guide and still we understand that that system might be confusing to some. Um, and so for us, it's holding that grace and making sure that we're taking that time out to retrain um, and to also provide additional training in hopes of supporting all of our team. Because we do recognize this is a professional development moment for our team as well, um, because we are all going through this together. Um, and so we're really trying to think about how are we still providing those professional development opportunities to all of our staff and not just have it necessarily lie with the team who created it, but how are we also giving all of our staff opportunities to create that professional development opportunity and dive into it as well. And so I think just really holding grace has been a really big thing for us too. Mm. So, uh, so grace uh, for yourselves uh, mm -hmm. and for your team members, uh, but also not letting perfect be the enemy of the good, trying some things and then learning right away and then fixing them where it didn't um, rather than holding off until we've got it just right. Um, Corey and Michael, you want to jump in here with some lessons that you've observed so far? Yeah, I want to add on to what Brandy just said. Um, I think it's also provided an opportunity to do that training in a different way than we have in the past, right? Because um, we could all hop on a Zoom call or a Teams call and try to share a screen and, and go through it. And I think that's how we started training. Um, but when we needed, when I as a supervisor of Residence Life Coordinators started getting the questions back of, how do I post my office hours again? And, and what do I click on exactly? And I'm sitting here like, I don't know, I don't have office hours. So um, getting one of, talking that through with one of our coordinators who does understand how to do that, um, and having him record his screen as he was doing it and narrating himself setting his office hours. So we're kind of like double dipping, like he was doing what he needed to do anyway, he just recorded himself doing it. Um, and then we were able to share that back with the team. So then everybody was able to have that video as a reference point. And it made me think about how um, we do things like that during training in the fall and in the summer for our professional staff all the time where we're talking about things that they're going to have to do in September in July. And right. it makes yeah. no sense. Right. It makes yeah. no sense. And we're training RAs in August how to do the job for the next nine months. Correct. Like, like as though that's going to stick. Right. So yeah. this is great. So this, I think this is, this is wonderful because it's a lesson that you're learning uh, that will apply beyond this pandemic. Right. Correct. There are some things that we should just, we should record it and then people can refer back to it anytime they want. Uh, right. the, the one that I'm thinking about is during orientation, teaching students about Title IX processes on campus, and we overwhelm them with way too much information, and they all think it's not going to happen to them. So what do we get them then, and what could we have them easily accessible so they can go back to it at 2 o'clock in the morning on their friend's worst night of their life, right, Yeah. when they need it? And so this is, this is maybe an asset of the asynchronous learning that you can do in this remote learning environment. Correct. Right? Uh, Michael, what lessons are you learning? I have two things, I think, uh, that I've been thinking a lot about. The first is a literal student engagement thing that I think we just forget about, right? We set a schedule to be business hours because we were like, oh, this is when we work. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to do a morning meditation at 10 and we're going to do an academic success hour at 2 and then we're going to do something fun at 4 and be done. Well, guess what? That doesn't work. It worked at the beginning uh, because it was like, what's this new thing on my canvas that I am now seeing? And we have seen some participation decline, right? So over the last week or so and going into even next week, we have adjusted our schedule and shifted it down completely. Um, we've heard from students and we've heard from staff members that faculty aren't hosting live lectures as often as they're recording and letting students navigate time on their own. And so students aren't waking up until noon um, and they work through the business hours and do their homework and study during those times. And then they get into the evening and they're scrolling Instagram and TikTok. And so they're sitting there waiting for someone to latch on to. Right. And right. so uh, we started doing that this week and now we're even doing that even more intentionally next week about shifting our schedule down to the evening um, and flexing our staff time to make sure that we can, um, you know, do that because we got to meet our students where they're at and yeah. nine to five doesn't work. We know that in housing and it's just another refresher, right? That we need to make right. those adjustments. 
So and the, we need to get on student schedule and not on our schedule. And I think we can do that by flexing time and moving the times that we work to different times, but also some of this asynchronous thing. You could record it at two o'clock in the afternoon and post it at 9 p.m., uh, which might be a different time or making these things available. So to really be student centered is what, what I'm hearing from you. What really is going on for students? What are their needs now? How have they changed? What are their schedules? What are their lives really looking like? Um, that's a great takeaway. You said you had two. What's the other one? Yeah, the other one is uh, I want to like think about team, right? So when we were first building Bulls in the Cloud, we started with um, Julie giving us the idea, Corey saying we need to do something about it from a curricular lens, and Steph, uh, one of our other coordinators, and I saying, okay, what are we going to do about it? And slowly over time, we have pulled the, the essential pieces in from our team who we know can lay a foundation for us. So if it was Brandy from the academic initiative side of the house, if it was one of my colleagues, Jack, who is just a bundle of energy and engagement and is gonna do great in front of the camera and understands what engagement virtually looks like, how do you engage with students in a chat function? That is scary to people. They don't see a face and they don't know how to engage with people. Jack understands how to do that. So let's add Jack to this so we can get creative with the content. Now we're talking about marketing. So we need students to know that we're still here without overwhelming them. So who on our team can we bring in an additional person? So now we've got a group of about four or five of us um, that are the core behind Bulls in the Cloud, elevating the rest of the work that we do and then pulling in the rest of our team to provide the content, um, the sessions, and pulling in campus partners who are really the experts, right? When we talk about that from a curricular lens as well. When we talk about wellness, we can talk about it all day, but there are people who do wellness coaching and work in the Center for Student Wellbeing that we have strong partnership with. So guess what? We're talking to them to join us next week on a stream and let them create some of that content for us, right? So how are you bringing the right people together we talk about hiring. This is another example of that. That, And you might be missing something at the beginning. That's okay. You'll pick it up and you can add to it later. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love this notion of teamwork and that, that no one can do this, but collectively we can do this. And I think what, I, what I'm hearing is you all trust each other. Uh, and not, I don't, you don't, each one of you doesn't have to do all the things because you trust that so-and-so is going to handle this. So-and-so is better at this, so we're going to let them do that. I'm going to focus on this thing. And I think that's another real asset of a curricular approach is not everybody's doing all the things, but we really find, uh, I think the best way is to, it's small teams. So you get more than just one person thinking, small teams really figuring this thing out. And then we all trust that they got it. And we all go ahead and implement that. And then this team is working on this and moving this forward. So teamwork uh, is really great but then you're also, sounds like you're trusting each other um, and not needing to, right? We got to let go a little bit of control, trust our colleagues, let them do it. I'll focus here, let them focus there. And together that can really help move this forward. I, I love these lessons learned. I'd, I'd like to invite a little bit more. So people watching this are not at University of South Florida. Um, they don't know that maybe even Bulls is your mascot. So the Bulls in the cloud really makes sense. But what, what suggestions would you have to others who, um, are pulling together their team on Monday morning and saying, you know, we, we really are doing this. Uh, we got to start thinking about this. What lessons would you have or what suggestions would you have to others who are making the shift? Yeah, I can jump in on that. I think that the next step for us as we continue going is cross posting. And so what I mean by that is looking at what our partners are doing across campus. We have um, a partner over in um, the student center who they're starting to do campus activities board now. And so we were able to cross post their Instagram um, in order to make sure that we're bringing attention to what they're doing and they're bringing attention to what we're doing. Um, we have colleagues over in the health portion of campus who are putting together cooking videos and talking about how to prepare um, meals that they can prepare easily at home, um, but they can still keep those as healthy, nutritious mm -hmm. meals as they keep going because we know, at least in Florida, we know that sometimes the food you get during a pandemic is not the healthiest food that you could possibly get. Um, and so I think cross-posting is, is really essential, especially when you, when you look outside of um, like higher ed in general and look over into 
what social media consultants are doing, cross-posting is where it's at. It's all mm -hmm. about getting people who have more Instagram followers than you um, to share your content in order for you to bring their followers to your page. And so um, as we keep moving forward, that's where we're headed. And I would encourage people to get on that right away. Right. Well, and, and uh, when we're not in this situation, we're talking about being good campus partners, not needing to be the experts at everything, involving these other folks. I think about it as integration. And so maybe students, you have students' attention. How do you get the great content from these other offices built in? And uh, that's just all better for students. So that's a, that's a great lesson. Uh, Brandy, what's a, what's a suggestion you'd have to others who are about to take on making the shift? Yeah, I think for me, it's recognizing everyone has different learning styles. Um, I think of how we approach learning styles in a classroom is the same way we should probably approach learning styles in our engagement. So we had originally started with just live streams and recently we just launched the discussion side. Um, so now we have students who, yes, there are students who want to be in the live stream. They want to engage right there. And then there are students who need to process. They need to reflect on the information that's being had and then they want to have discussions afterwards. And so um, I think for us, it's really thinking about that, thinking about what are the different learning styles of our students and also our staff when we go to train them as well. Right. I think this is a great suggestion because we all have different learning styles within us, right? And so how do we provide this information in a wide variety of ways, not to get at different learners, but to, to more effectively reach each learner. And so, uh, yeah, the live stream and the events, but also the processing and the reflection and some of those opportunities, lots of different ways. You And you all collectively have mentioned so many different ways of engaging from live stream videos of yoga uh, to video game and connections via Twitch to large events to Instagram, lots of different ways. Um, what's a lesson that you all are learning uh, that's gonna really help you as you move forward? And I'm thinking about into the fall, if we're gonna be doing this into the fall, and maybe even some lessons that you're learning that would, uh, uh, that would serve you well beyond this particular situation that we're all in right now. I'll jump in. I think um, I think that this is a wake up call. In like to be completely frank, I think when we talk about um, student staff struggling to connect with some students, um, and we call them ghost residents, or or we know that they're playing video games in their room, and that's a way to connect with them. Um, I think this is an opportunity for our department and the field itself to reframe how we're engaging with students and and it's not just about the in-person that our students are living online they are digital natives through and through um, and this is where they want to be and so i don't imagine that our department is going to completely you know cut our use of canvas when we go back to normal right. i i anticipate that um, it will be a component of how we implement the curriculum, how we meet people where they're at, um, because we might be able to catch that student. We might be able to get a student into a social justice event who wouldn't have come to that social justice event, but it is willing to do that virtually. Um, right. And it's a great lesson. I think my, my colleague, Grant Anderson, who's at the University of Minnesota says, you know, he was talking a year ago about how do we engage our residents in 3D and 2D. 3D in the rooms and in the lounges and 2D uh, Facebook and, and all these other places. And we can't just say 3D is better than 2D and forget it. That's, that's irresponsible. And now the 3D doesn't even exist. It's just 2D. And so I think you're right. It's going to make us better at when we come back to this, doing the 2D and the 3D in that way. I also think we've talked a lot about streaming. Like I think we've always talked about streaming. How are we streaming? How are we um, utilizing our events to stream them too? And so I think we've been trying to figure out what does that look like? And I think Bulls in the Cloud has allowed us to say, okay, let's experiment everything we can. So when we do have an in-person event again, like finals reviews that we were wanting to stream anyways, now we have an opportunity of when our spaces hit capacity, we can still stream because we know how and we feel comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Corey, what's the, what's the big takeaway for you? You've, you've kind of been uh, orchestrating this and, and um, leading it and um, watching all of this play out. What's the big takeaway for you? What's the macro lesson that you're learning as you go through this? I think the macro lesson is that change is hard <laughs> and it's it's hard for everybody and 
I think for me, my job through this isn't always to be the content creator, right? Um, my job is to help um, our team be successful and know, um, ask the hard questions for them and, and get the resources that they need to be successful. Um, and I, I think that's inherent in my role in, in all of this. And so in that way, I'm able to see both um, the perspective of those who are on the Bulls in the Cloud team who can, who are in day-to-day -day creating um, content and creating the platform itself. Um, and I'm able to see those who are a little bit slower to change um, and help them process through it as well. Um, as well as I'm one of the people who's been talking to residents who have been having a really hard transition and, and want just want to come back and get their, their belongings and um, and move their items out, but now they can't. And so um, I think the process of change, and we talked a little bit about giving grace, but I think that comes more into um, how we supervise and how we um, help people process through all of this. And there's truth in everybody's experience, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And there, and that even if those experiences are at odds at times, um, my job is to help them see each other's perspectives and and to keep going through that. And so as we continue to change, because this isn't just this is where we're at now and, and this is what we're doing, we're not going to be in quarantine forever. We're going to change again and then we're going to change again after that. And so um, helping everybody continue to adapt to that and continue to live in that change um, in ways and interact in ways that is helpful for them to to still maintain this trust that we do have as a team um, as we continue moving through it because I think we've been implementing now for two full weeks well things are going to continue to go and and I think that's my job is to help everybody continue to move in what are we going to look at like in two weeks and is that trust still going to be there or how are we continuing to build that back up um, so that's kind of where my focus is starting to go and um, thinking about thinking about our team in general. Um, yeah, I think there's the other side of that, which is our students um, and thinking about where we go from here. We know that we're not going to have camp students on campus this summer. And so what does that look like for us using this platform for students who are about to come in and who are future bulls and bringing them in so that they can start their fall um, and we started talking about that, like this fall semester, if things go the way we want them to, um, it's going to be a huge welcome back, right? And so how are we continuing and starting this conversation when they still are not on campus, um, but still helping them um, get excited about coming to campus and, and being a bull and, and living with us then, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So. Well, you know, that what you're describing is just leadership, right? You're helping right. bring your team together. You're helping them navigate the change. You're, you're paying attention at the micro level and really helping navigate that. So that's really great. Well, I want to I wanna thank all three of you for, for joining us and, and talking through some of this. Corey, if people want to find out more about what you all are doing, is there a website you want to direct them to or an email or what's the best way for people who want to find out a little bit more? Yeah, I think at this point, um, we're still operating via email because we're creating things as we go. Um, so you can email me at C-O-R-E-Y-J-O-H-N-S-O at USF.edu. Great. Uh, well, thanks to all three of you for joining us. I really appreciate it. I think this will be really helpful to other people who are just beginning to think about this. Uh, I think they'll probably steal some of your good ideas and your good ideas will help them think about some others. And I really appreciate your willingness to share your lessons learned and some of the things that hasn't gone so well. I think it's a great contribution to our profession and the students on other campuses. So thank you all very much. Uh, again, my name is Keith Edwards. Um, I'm a speaker, consultant, and coach. And you can find out more about me at keithedwards.com. Check out the great work these folks at University of South Florida are doing. And if you want to reach out more, uh, feel free to give them a shout out and email. Until then, I hope you are all well, uh, literally, and uh, good luck with the work that you're doing in service of students uh, wherever you are. Thanks very much.